Hello and welcome to this webinar on IT outsourcing and cybersecurity. This will be a fireside chat hosted by two renowned cybersecurity experts. Swati Sharma, who's the lead InfoSec officer at Amazon Pay, and Kashik Pandey, vice president here at Control Case. I'm Evan Travis, and I'm on the video team at Control Case. Before we begin the main presentation, a few housekeeping items. This webinar will run approximately 45 minutes. If you have any questions, please place them in the questions window. Our moderators will pass them on, and we will either answer them live or by email if we run short of time. If you experience any audio or visual issues, please type them into the chat window and our moderators will address them. A summary and a recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone early next week. Please visit our website at www.controlcase.com for more webinars. A little bit about Control Case. We at Control Case have one focus, IT compliance and related certifications. Compliance and continuous compliance services are a key area of focus in what we do for our customers. We are not checklist auditors. By contrast, we partner with our customers in our assessments and audits. We utilize our proprietary software called the Control Case Compliance Hub to automate and streamline our processes. Finally, our flagship offering is known as One Audit, where customers can do a single assessment and get compliant with or certified to multiple regulations. And with that, I'll pass it over to our main presentation. Let's get started. Um, just taking a little bit background, uh, we do understand that uh, in today, or let's say in today's era, um, the need for IT outsourcing is enormous, right? Especially uh, when the global economy is turning here and there. Um, so at the same time, when organizations are looking forward to outsource their IT activities to different countries uh, based upon let's say the different models, like it can be an onshore or inshore or nearshore, depending upon, uh, let's say the IT security strategies. Um, organizations are also required to tackle the security gaps, the threats, the vulnerabilities, and accordingly devise a solution as well, because that is what um, uh, you can say the IT team, the IT security team is there for. Uh, and to help us uh, with the same, we have over here, our industry expert uh, who have been leading uh, similar cybersecurity practices from quite some time. Uh, I know her from more, more than a decade uh, or so. Uh, and we all welcome uh, Swati. Uh, hey, Swati, how are you? Uh, it's really great to have you with us. Uh, and we really thank you because we know that you are always jam packed with different teams, as we all know that, okay, cyber intruders never let you sleep peacefully. So uh, thanks a lot uh, today for taking your time and enlightening us uh, and the audience, of course, with the best practice around IT outsourcing uh, and things like that. So uh, can you just help us with the, let's say, help the audience with a brief about like uh, what are milestones, what are things have you been doing so far so that the, the team, the audience can get a context? Please. Thanks, Koshing, for inviting me for this session. And uh, we know each other for a long time. And I think, uh, Thanks for giving that generous uh, introduction. So those who have not interacted with me in past or those who, are, who have like never uh, uh, seen me on social media or in other uh, platforms. My name is Swati Sharma. I'm working with Amazon. I'm taking care of global security policies right now. I'm taking care of policy exceptions, strategy decisions, security governance, data classification on some of these aspects. Uh, before moving to this role, I was uh, in AWS. I was taking care of Indian financial uh, industry customers and helping them in onboarding to AWS. Before that, I was uh, I worked with British Telecom, taking care of PCI DSS and GDPR, third party security related risk. And I started my career with uh, CISA Information, uh, which is a P PCI company. And there I have interacted with multiple customers to help them on PCI, risk assessment, and other areas. So that's all about me. Over to you, Kaushik. 
Uh, thank you, Lord Swati, for the same. And uh, having said that, Swati has also been on the cover page of uh, many a cybersecurity magazines as well in the past. She is very generous. She 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 doesn't uh, tell us that much uh, about herself. But having said that, if you do a little bit of Google search around Swati Sharma, all right, you will get a lot lots of art articles around the same. All right. So having said that, we have brought an expert over here who will be able to help us uh, in understanding the entire. Uh, IT outsourcing and how exactly it works and things like that. So uh, let's start with the most basic question of all, right? Uh, if let's say an organization is quite new in IT outsourcing, uh, uh, they are just planning to outsource a few of the IT services, right? let's say IT services to different, different service providers. Uh, what exactly will be your definition of, of about IT outsourcing, specifically around IT outsourcing? Because outsourcing can be of different, different terms, right? So what Correct. do we mean around IT outsourcing? If you can help us with so I'll keep it very naive or very simple, uh, Kaushik. I'll say uh, let expert do their job. So if IT is not your core business, if it's not your core objective, let experts do their job. So companies who have been expert in developing applications, softwares, let them uh, develop software for, uh, for you or build application for you. If you have not been managing servers or if you don't know how to manage servers, let IT hosting companies take care of it or let cloud companies do their work. Uh, depending on what you want to achieve, uh, anything which is related with IT, it can include your utility, applications, software, IT infrastructure, uh, including IT services, managed services. All that can be done by third parties and that's typically called IT outsourcing. Great, great. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, um, uh, Swati. And I believe that uh, the audience will also resonate with this, especially uh, uh, the audience whosoever would have joined from the Indian subcontinent as well. We are not new to uh, the IT services getting outsourced uh, to us. And um, uh, having said that, uh, anything or everything around IT, which is outsourced, let's say, from somewhere or the other to us, or let's say, when I say to us, to means any of us, uh, for uh, finishing off that particular job, on behalf of somebody else that is uh, IT outsourcing and uh, ve oh, very well said by uh, Swati as well uh, that okay how exactly it works and uh, having uh, said that because uh, I know Swati from uh, you from a long time uh, I know that okay you have been a part of many of the uh, the C-level uh, meetings as well the C-level executive meetings as well uh, and I know that okay you have seen uh, the IT strategies as well uh, being developed. You have seen how exactly it has grown from the past, let's say, more, more than a decade or so. So based upon your uh, interaction with the other C-level executives and with the other uh, leaders, um, where exactly does this IT outsourcing fit in the entire IT strategy development uh, era? Can you just help us with that? Yeah. Sure, I think this need to be combined or aligned with two portions, uh, Kaushik. One is your overall business outsourcing is strategy, IT strategy and where it fits for IT outsourcing strategy. Uh, you need to identify what you want to deliver. Uh, do you have that expertise in-house? Uh, do you want to rely on outsiders like third parties for that? When you want it, I think uh, time for launch right or go to market is a key decision maker uh, when we are considering all these factors so let's assume even if you have bandwidth to develop that in-house but you know that it will take longer but if you partner with third party you can go to market faster uh, companies take this decision so considering what you want to achieve when you want to achieve do you have in-house skills or expertise bandwidth time to go to market and then this IT outsourcing strategy can be aligned. But again, this has to be mapped back with your business outsourcing, business strategy, and overall IT strategy. What is your long-term plan? Five to 10 years, uh, three years, immediate. So based on that, you can draft what you want to achieve through this IT outsourcing. Great, great, awesome, Swati. Uh, and I believe that it uh, perfectly resonates with uh, how you started the definition of IT outsourcing as well that uh, do what you do best, do the business, outsource your IT services, IT security services or whatnot to different service providers who already have, uh, uh, let's say an experience in a similar domain uh, because they will have more competence around it. 
uh, and uh, as you very, very rightly mentioned that it needs to align with your roadmap as well for the next three years, five years, 10 years down the line. Uh, and it's not just about being cost effective. I Means, of course, it will be cost free because that's why you are outsourcing uh, something which you can do it by yourself and outsourcing to a different third party. But at the end of the day, it just doesn't end up uh, being a cost effective solution. It's also about more competence. It's also about more knowledge. It's also about more experience as well in a similar domain. And uh, uh, having said that, also, they'll maintain your PDRP as well. In the case, let's say you fall short of, then they will have enough uh, people or resources to manage the thing. So uh, thank you for the, for the same. And building on, uh, let's say, the similar terms, what we, uh, uh, let's say, just discussed about uh, the IT strategy development, and uh, we have seen uh, plenty of uh, things throughout the same. Uh, one more, uh, uh, you can say, uh, one more point, one more uh, a strategy uh, resonates, uh, let's say, familiarizes us over here when we talk about supply chain management as well because uh, recently we have seen lots and lots of threat vectors vulnerabilities breaches happening around supply chain management a different service provider gets breached gets attacked and accordingly the customer also gets impacted in the same manner and uh, based upon my limited understanding they might be somewhere related as well like it outsourcing and supply chain management right in a similar manner so uh, what exactly are your views around this like how exactly is it outsourcing related to uh, supply chain management uh, specifically from a cyber security standpoint i think there is overlap uh... If, if I can simplify it right, there is overlap between supply chain management and this IT outsourcing part. But one thing that we have to remember when we are talking about this IT outsourcing part, the risk is on a higher side. It's not like any other outsourcing, right? Even in case of normal outsourcing, uh, we have seen that how those vendors have impacted the overall security of the organization. Uh, if you remember, there was one uh, payment data breach where not core IT system, but the HVAC systems were compromised and then it further led to the uh, cardholder data breach. If those kind of vendors can be targeted, right? Imagine some companies which have access to your servers or which are building applications for you. So there is an overlap when we are talking about supply chain uh, management and this IT, IT outsourcing, but we should not treat it as same. The risks which are associated with IT outsourcing is I mean, I'll say that they are on higher side. Got it, got it, Swati. So, uh, and and as you rightly mentioned, uh, the HVAC systems uh, being used, or let's say the systems of the HVAC service provider uh, being used to compromise uh, the customer. And in a similar manner, many of the, uh, I believe, hospitality companies as well, uh, in the recent past have uh, gone breached because of their service providers' credentials getting compromised um, sure. at the end of the day, right? So. N number of different breaches happening, and uh, I believe the cyber intruders are just looking for that one mistake, and that particular one mistake can be at the customer's end or at the service provider's end, whosoever. Uh, and I believe that is uh, one of the point where, um, when we are choosing, uh, let's say, the third-party service provider for the IT outsourcing, I believe all these due diligence uh, should should be done at that particular manner, right? So I think what so what exactly you say, say about this that okay what exact due diligence uh, we, we should be doing around the same i think you start with what you are looking for what kind of uh, impact that service provider will have on your overall cyber security how much access they have how much data you are sharing with them are they giving you just something which you can customize secure by yourself and then they have no relation like in terms of your production environment uh, assume that they have access continuously to your production environment. So based on where they are sitting in that risk tier, I think you need to assess the risk associated and do the due diligence. Uh, putting all the eggs in like same bucket will be also like of too much uh, and you'll not be able to assess the right uh, supply, uh, like supply chain related risk associated with, with that particular vendor. So identify where that vendor is sitting in terms of risk in your cybersecurity chain and then perform the due diligence based on that. Minimum things that need to be done is that you have to understand how they're dealing with your data, what they're doing with it. Do you have control over your data? Sometime organization, they assume that uh, 
outsourcing is like transfer of risk answer is like don't assume that it's a transfer of risk it's actually sharing of risk and how much you are sharing with them and the moment you are sharing it with them how they are taking care of it ultimately you are accountable for your data your processes your it infrastructure so considering that due diligence has to be in proportion to the risk that is associated uh, don't go overboard don't do like under protection be in balance of what actually need to be protected thanks a lot swati for that and i believe uh, one of the latest uh, uh, regulator also said in their it outsourcing guidelines that uh, whenever you are trying to outsource just taking your words uh, over here what you just mentioned uh, just by doing an outsourcing of it services it doesn't mean that uh, let's say uh, the risk is being transferred or the other service provider will be able to apply lesser controls uh, assume yes. that okay the same controls what you would have applied if you would have taken the regular service insured the similar kind of let's say greater than that level of cyber security control exactly. should be applied right exactly fantastic, fantastic swati uh it's always uh, nice to interact with you on these particular patterns um, and i believe that uh, uh, now we'll uh, try to uh, cut some core as well uh, and specifically we'll talk about um uh, uh, let's say uh, from the company uh, which is ever growing in nature and uh, i believe uh, everyone knows about the regular company as well so let's talk about aws as well in some manner right uh, now we know that AWS is a giant over here, right? When it comes to IT outsourcing, when it comes to a uh, similar manner. And I know that, okay, tackling risk in AWS will be like gigantic in nature. I cannot even imagine how exactly AWS will be, uh, because every, each and every eyes is on AWS at the end of the day, right? So what, what exactly words of wisdom uh, you can give us from, uh, let's say, from AWS perspective that, okay, how exactly is AWS uh, tackling the risk in IT outsourcing from a customer perspective? Uh, because at the end of the day, all the customers will be relying on AWS, right? Uh, that uh, they'll be maintaining top-notch security, will I know, which I know that, okay, yes, uh, they maintain it quite well as well. So what exactly are your views around it? So, I mean, based on my work uh, in the AWS days, I think one thing which is co at the core is that whatever we are building, it's for customer, right? Imagine that a company which is building their services, their products for a regulated customer, right? So AWS is offering services to financial customer, government customer. So their baseline is so high that if someone have someone need to move to AWS, uh, they will get the baseline which is like higher from the normal infrastructure. Uh, what is a secret recipe and it's not like secret anymore actually so imagine the economy of a scale right aws has or cloud service provider has they can invest much more than any other company because they have they are building it for many more customers and because they are building it for a lot more customers they have more investment they can build or they can invest in skills which are required to build a secure uh, infrastructure or secure services that are being consumed by the uh, customers or their uh, enterprise customer. One thing which is important that no matter how secure your cloud provider is, you have to understand the shared responsibility model. If you assume that everything is being taken care by cloud service provider and you don't have to do anything, you'll be going wrong. Uh, based on what services are being consumed, understand what is a shared responsibility model. What are the controls which are being taken care by the cloud provider? What are the controls which are being uh, which you need to take care of? For the controls which are being taken care by the cloud service provider, make sure that you have artifacts, information, evidence to ensure or to get the assurance so that you can also provide that assurance to your regulators, your auditor. For example, uh, if you need to be PCI DSS compliant and you decided to go with infrastructure as service, you need to ensure that requirement nine of PCI DSS, which is related with physical security control, AWS's AOC covers requirement nine in detail as per your requirement. Similarly, if you want to use uh, some service in your uh, regulated or uh, scoped environment, for example, you want to use HSM or K KMS, 
you have to ensure that those services are covered in the audited scope of cloud service providers so that if you want to use them there is no constraint uh, so understand what you want to use whether it is covered in the audited scope or not or compliance scope do the assurance perform the check one thing which i feel that and it's based on the uh, interaction that i had in uh, during aws days that companies focus too much on only on the cloud side they don't uh, focus on the security in the cloud uh, side which is very important if you look at the security breaches which happened in cloud those happen because of the misconfiguration and misconfigurations are mostly uh, in control of customers or hosted entities uh, physical security controls uh, companies give a lot of emphasis but trust me companies like any cloud provider i mean I, i'm not talking only about the aws but any cloud service provider for them if it's their bread and butter right they'll not mess on some of the like fundamental requirements uh, where things go wrong if customers don't understand what they need to implement and they miss on that part they are not focusing or was focusing on how to configure cloud i was reading one report which used to say that cloud is secure are you using it securely so i think that's the baseline that i would use that cloud is secure are you using it securely is a like fundamental thing absolutely absolutely swati i believe that okay your last statement was bang on in nature that okay the cloud is always secure but uh, are you using it securely are you configuring it uh, securely in a particular manner and i believe that uh, majority of these things boil down to the responsibility matrix which is being maintained between a cloud service provider and the customer and after that let's say the next level is understanding that responsibility matrix as well so uh, let's say the customer the customer team should be able to uh, get a real good clarity on the responsibility matrix um, and because i have worked with who as well for a few of the certifications over cloud and i've seen that okay AWS maintains top-notch security. Um, uh, even we were not able to get evidences as well uh, for our compliances uh, many of the times. Uh, so no access, nothing. Uh, that that level of uh, let's say security is being maintained uh, over there in AWS. So uh, it's 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 really uh, top-notch in nature. Uh, and uh, uh, having said that, so uh, that was about AWS and how exactly it uh, uh, let's say helps protect majority of the customers, including majority of the customers who would have joined this regular call as well. Uh, and let's try to uh, change some trajectory and try to go into uh, the legal aspect over here, right? Uh, because um, uh, the IT outsourcing is not just related to the IT security, which let's say you and me are managing, but also depends upon the legal as well. Because whenever the idea of sourcing is happening, the legal as well come into picture, right? And there are many laws, regulations, standards which come under uh, picture. So, what exactly are views around it? That uh, 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 are the organizations following it, or let's say uh, what exactly they should follow at the end of the day? Okay, whenever they are looking forward for IT outsourcing. I think it's important that the interpretation is being done properly. Uh, again i'm going back on uh, my aws days i used to go on go in meetings where people say that i heard that this is a requirement and when you ask them where it is written uh, there wasn't any evidence so when you're talking about these regulatory and regulatory requirement i think start with what is written engage your lawyer understand what it says and talk to industry uh, experts as well to understand the how it is being implemented and adopted i think based on that you start implementation and evaluation part i think these are non negotiable in nature i mean honestly speaking if someone is asking me or if i'm sitting at at the side where i'm responsible for taking care of these requirements legal regulatory these things will be non negotiable for me uh, I, i'll not mess up on these requirements at the same time i'll make sure that i'm interpreting it in a correct way i'm not doing or overboarding there right if i am in doubt i'll go and ask and use the communication channels uh, which are there with the regulators to understand the right interpretation and then start going uh, in the implementation side uh, talk to the industry leaders or uh, your community and then go for like choosing the right uh, service provider for that for service providers no, again not meeting these requirements it's like a business edge right if they don't meet 
applicable regulatory requirement they'll not be able to serve to the customer so for them also it's it's like an indirect mandate that they have to follow how you will ensure that they're meeting it or not uh go and like call with them understand what they're meeting is there any assurance around it for example are they impaneled with uh meti right for example uh if, if it's a cloud provider are they providing you certifications around SOC to PCI based on what you are looking for? And if required, go on call, discuss it with them, ask that how other customers have done it in like in that particular region. Data residency or data control ship. So how those requirements are being met, uh, understand and then go for it. Data residency is something which is like uh, it's changing or it's evolving uh, over the time. So based on where your customers are, what are the regulation applicable, how you're hosting your data, where you are hosting your data, how you can ensure that the applicable laws and requirements are being, can be enforced and auditable. So I think these are some steps that need to be taken, but don't go by hearsay. I think a uh, lot of time uh, they heard it, they have not read it, they have not interpreted it, and they're just going by like, okay, someone has said something and must be true and they go by it. Correct, correct. Fantastic. And the last point about the data residency, I believe it was a bang on uh, because uh, I believe each and every country, each and every nation state is coming out with their, their own guidelines uh, around the data residency that it cannot cross their border at any point. And if it's crossing, then what will let's say things have to be maintained. The first copy has to be kept in some other place, blah, 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 and everything. Right. Um, and I believe that just to add to what Swati mentioned, uh, so whenever, let's say we are looking at uh, the legalities, uh, please do not, uh, let's say, please do not just focus on the IT aspects of it or the IT, uh, the, the IT Act. Also focus on the privacy as well, the, the privacy factors, because that will uh, be a deal breaker. I'm, I'm telling right because if let's say um, uh, the IT outsourcing has been done in India, but the data is coming from Europe. Or let's say from any other European nation, then you have to be in compliance with GDPR, even though you are in India, right? So the local law of land of Europe stands there in India. Uh, right. So all these things uh, need to be taken care of whenever uh, you are planning for uh, IT outsourcing. So uh, the legal team, whosoever you are hiring, they should be, uh, you can say, uh, working on a state of the art architecture altogether. Um, otherwise, at a later point in time, uh, in the case of an incident, which fingers crossed shouldn't happen, but in the case of an incident, uh, these things are something which helps you. Uh, if you have like an airtight, uh, uh, you can say the, the contracts, the legals and all those things, whatever you have fine. So uh, uh, now coming from a global and uh, talking about local. Uh, in India, right, uh, Swati. So, uh, how do you think that um, uh, India is uh, tackling the uh, IT outsourcing and th things like that? Are there any relevant regulations uh, being developed in India around it? Is uh, any regulator uh, helping us with the same around IT outsourcing? I think India understood that IT outsourcing is like one of their fundamental uh, or core service sector where we are doing very well, right? We are serving to like global entities, uh, multinationals. Uh, there have been always outsourcing uh, guidelines and mandates in place. If I talk uh, about RBI like in a financial space, they had guidelines which they published in 2016. Uh, sorry, uh, 23 uh, uh, and then uh, 2003. And they have published it recently also for these specific uh, segments. For example, payment companies, they have launched recently IT outsourcing guidelines. I think one thing which is uh, understood by the regulators are that these guidelines have to be enabler. They need to address the risk which are associated with IT outsourcing, but at the same time, they don't want this innovation to be uh, restricted. So they are enabling, they are giving multiple options to the entity so that they can comply with the regulations or requirements so that they can address the data protection or security related requirement. But at the same time, they are not trying to hinder their progress or innovation. So I think there is fair balance if I talk about these IT outsourcing guidelines. Similarly, IRDA also has like pretty detailed IT outsourcing guidelines. Similarly, SEBI has multiple IT outsourcing guidelines depending on 
which segment of regulation you are tied with and for other segment if we talk about try also have similar requirements and then in general also uh, METI and certain they have guidelines around what need to be assessed when IT outsourcing is being done. Thanks, thank you for, for that Swati. So as rightly being mentioned by Swati, um, RBI uh, is one of the uh, front running uh, regulator over there when it comes to let's say managing that how exactly IT outsourcing should be done at the end of the day. And recently they uh, released uh, one of the guidelines. The draft came I believe in 2022 and right now uh, the final version has been uh, released. And uh, for those of you who uh, haven't seen it, please go through it because it's for the regulated entities uh, from uh, RBI. And uh, uh, let's say the regulated entities need to make sure that their service providers, if there are any agreements which are done, then there are certain dates as well, which has been mentioned over there. So you have to be in compliance before the regular date, like if, let's say before October 1, 2023, uh, if your agreement has, uh, let's say, up for renewal, uh, then uh, uh, with the outsourcing directions, you have to be in compliance latest by April 10, 2024. Uh, however, if there is an agreement which comes for renewal after October 1, 2023, then uh, let's say you get two more years. So by April 10, 2026, uh, you have to be in compliance. Um, however, if let's say uh, any organization is going for uh, such an agreement after October 1st, 2023, then from the date of that particular agreement itself, uh, you have to be in compliance with the latest guidelines, right? So please have a look at it. And uh, it is specifically for the regulated entities um, as such. Uh, and uh, it's for the IT outsourcing, uh, which is there. Okay, And there are certain exclusions as well over there. And they have particularly mentioned that what are the exclusions who all come under this particular, uh, let's say, IT outsourcing or let's say IT service provider listing. And things like that and it's also applicable to uh this is a SOC service providers as well okay so they have uh two different annexures over there one is around the cloud the cloud service providers and the second is around the SOC service providers so if you are any one of the two please go have a look at it but accordingly you can understand uh, better uh, how to manage the regular entities uh from uh, let's say here so uh, uh coming to uh let's say the end of this particular fireside chat, I should say, uh, Swati, um, uh, what exactly will be your advice? Because you have seen uh, threats, you have seen breaches as well. I know that, okay, uh, you uh, would have investigated a few breaches as well in your past. Uh, and you have seen how organizations who, uh, because you have been an auditor uh, yourself. So you have seen organizations that, okay, who show that, they are top notch. They have all the, let's say, the top notch cybersecurity team, the tools, technologies, and everything. But when you went for the audit, you saw that, okay, everything is just showbiz, right? So, so I think what exactly will be your uh, suggestion to our uh, uh, audience over here when they're trying to uh, outsource their IT? I think, again, I'll go back on the risk side, right? If you're sharing your critical uh, data, uh, directly indirectly or giving access to your critical infrastructure critical data uh, please make sure that uh, you are doing it proper due diligence in terms of ongoing compliance and security so it should not be just a piece of paper that some uh, someone has provided you you have to ask question to ensure that you are getting enough assurance in terms of ongoing security and ongoing compliance don't over trust your service provider uh, in terms of if there are some controls that you need to take care of on top of service provider control uh, go for it and there has to be a proper assurance program third party security program which is taking care of these service providers on regular basis it should not be just one time activity at the onboarding it should be defined based on the frequency for example if it is uh, like highly sensitive data that you are sharing a critical third party for you it can be six monthly annual assessments it can be due diligence based on the documents that they are providing it can be questionnaire based on where in which which risk tier they are sitting on involve your team it can be including your compliance officers your lawyers understand what are the applicable mandatory requirement 
from regulatory and compliance point of view including your uh, local laws or industry standard requirements on top of that risk assessment need to be performed to identify security controls that need to be inbuilt or to be implemented assess the third party uh, uh, guidelines for example if you know that there is vulnerability which is like uh, known at that point of particular uh, time how that has been aggregated or the how that can be addressed for that particular service provider if there are something which is like known problem areas for your partner or if they have bad track record i think those questions need to be asked uh, rigorously before uh, you make your decision great great uh, so i believe that the hard talks should should be done uh, during the initial days itself rather than to repent later because we don't know that okay what will happen at a later point in time right and uh, uh, one particular point which swati has been i believe she would have repeated at least 10 times till now is about risk about risk assessment is about risk governance as well so uh, a team audience please take a note of it that the risk assessment plays a very 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 crucial role uh, when you are trying to outsource your it services to a third party service provider and uh, how exactly you can do that there are n number of ways uh, but one particular thing which uh, we always suggest is first of all identify the data classify the data right accordingly you'll be under, able to understand the criticality of the data which you are trying to share with a third party because uh, believe me uh, when you share with a third party you are not just sharing it with that particular third party but that particular third party service provider might be having their own service providers as well okay right? so it's a long ending chain you might not be able to identify the tail of it so uh whenever you are doing that please do a data classification and then accordingly based upon your let's say your risk asset register try to identify if you want to really outsource this particular data handling of this particular data to a third party service provider and if let's say by all means you have to then the stricter the security control should be based upon the criticality of the data which you have right fantastic swati it was it was really uh, good when you uh, pinched on that risk assessment and you uh, didn't uh, lose the hold as well you particularly said okay risk assessment risk assessment and i absolutely agree with you so uh, any last words uh, from you swati before we move to the q and a and any last words which you have around the idea of sourcing and things like that i think one thing that i have noticed right so i was reading few days back that some of the large companies like capital one bp they have closed their own data centers and they have decided to move to aws so companies so how it started right uh, 10 years or 15 years back they thought that okay it is something that they can invest they can like build their own infrastructure they can run it but over the time they realized that no it's not their core business their core business is probably finance or banking and it is not something that they need to get into so they 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 identify the right partner and they have like outsourced it so there are success stories where they identified what a, what they what should be their focus who should be the right partner in their journey and how to build that partnership and at the same time how to address the cyber security compliance and regulatory uh, risk with the proper partnership and sharing so i think don't be scared with it outsourcing or with your partners uh, do proper due diligence and identify right a strategy to go for it great thanks thanks lot for that swati and i believe that okay we cannot thank you uh, much more for taking your time uh, for us uh, because you really have provided many words of wisdom many of uh, uh, let's say uh, corporate intelligence uh, to us which uh, which is not present in books or which is not present in uh regulations or the standards whatever uh, let's say because uh, when we look at a standard we look at uh, uh the best practices but when it actually gets implemented on the ground the reality is a bit different and uh, you you rightly mention all the things from the similar line so thanks for and uh, there are lots and lots of questions which are popping up uh i'll just take a few of them depending upon uh let's say the time which we have uh so the first question which we have uh, over here is that uh, 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 we have a merchant who have more than like 500 stores also uh, and e-commerce workplace and they are outsourcing to or they are planning to outsource their call center services 
So uh, they're, they're asking our expert opinion as to what will risks they should uh, cater to when they are trying to outsource their BP or the call center services. I think. I think they should start with when this call center is being introduced. Uh, these call center agents, are they going to handle their critical data? For example, are they going to handle payment information for their customer? Are they going to access uh, financial information, right? If answer is yes, the applicable regulations like or, and the industry standard, for example, PCIDS is applicability that need to be identified. When we are talking about these uh, third parties, like uh, need to identify that what is going to be voice infrastructure. IT infrastructure is generally being taken care of with more emphasis by now like people understand like how important it is but voice network what kind of voice network is being used and what will be the technology used to secure the data over it so for example if call recording is happening how that is being handled if the uh, truncation is scrapping of the data is happening there how it is being taken care if the regulations are applicable on those part of the data how that is being uh, taken care of so i think all those new uh, like details need to be understood before you are going in that direction. On top of that, based on your geography, there can be applicable laws that need to be handled. For example, if you are in EU or your data centers are in EU or your customers are in EU, how that need to be addressed. Uh, a privacy aspect need to be taken care of. Well, if you are handling customer data, customer, customer personal identifiable information uh, through those call centers or over the calls. Thanks, yeah, and I believe that uh, Swati might not uh, tell you guys uh, the same, but uh, when she used to do audit at that time, she would have identified a lot of customers having CV2 as well, or the pin value as well being stored. Although uh, as for PCA compliance, you cannot, right? And they have been compliance as well from past many years. But when she went for audit, she identified that okay, it's there in the logs, there's the database, n number of different different places, right? So, as, as rightly being mentioned, uh, please have a look at uh, which are compliances you need to maintain um, and accordingly see are they maintaining uh, it as well or let's say are the service providers as well maintaining the same thing. Uh, uh, control case is a particular tool known as a compliance finder tool which you can go and uh, check. Uh, so, if you're a BP organization, if you're any of these organizations, you can just, uh, 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 let's say, type in your business over there that what kind of business you have, it will be able to tell you which all compliances you need to maintain and how exactly you should be maintaining as well. That is something which is a word of thought over here. Uh, so, uh, the next question which we have is that from a regular entity, uh, which is saying that, okay, they're planning to outsource their payment switch to a third party. Uh, what security measure, measure should be uh, maintained by them? Okay, so I think uh, when you're talking about payment switch, uh, there can be two type of regulations. I'm, I'm talking about India specific uh, geography right now. RBI has certain requirements which are like directly coming for these segments, right? And then on top of that, PCIDS is a requirement. You need to clearly understand that are these service providers going to be directly regulated or the regulation piece will remain with you and they will be just your IT service provider or uh, they'll be hosting it on your behalf. So what is going to be the relationship or the agreement in terms of the security and compliance obligation? And again, uh, what will be the model? Will they be just building it for you? Then you'll be running it. They'll be running it on your behalf. They'll have constant access on top of it. So how that all operational aspects are going to be uh, worked upon that need to be understand uh, understood where they are going to host it in India outside India if they are planning to do it outside India are they taking care of RBI uh, data localization aspects so all those things need to be understood well before making that decision and that's the I think payment switch when you're talking about you are actually talking about a heavy piece uh, people who have seen payment side of the word, they understand like the moment you say payment switch, it's actually a heavy piece in the entire payment ecosystem that someone is referring to. Great, great. So, Zati, I believe uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I believe uh, last year, uh, sometime when uh, last year, last, last year, sometime when RBI released the digital payment security controls, I believe that was one of the like uh, a combined framework for each and every payment security control, right. whatever was possible. So if you are applying to outsource your payment switch, please have a look at that as well and make sure that whatever is applicable, those kinds of payment security controls or the certifications 
uh, yes. your uh, uh, let's say IT outsourcer or the service provider is maintaining at the end of the day, right? Uh, the last question which uh, we'll take because uh, we are just out of time. Uh, uh, so uh, the last question which I'll take, of course, I'll choose from the ones. Um, uh, so based upon your experience, Swati, uh, how exactly does big organizations manage their own IT outsourcing? And um, uh, how exactly they give comfort to the organizations who are trying to also their ID services to such huge players because uh, it's a two-way street, right? Okay. Right. I'm a big service provider. I'm a, I'm a uh, like a giant by myself, and uh, many of the organizations are outsourcing the services to me. But I'll also be outsourcing my services as well to some. So right. how exactly the risk, the things are managed over there? Sorry. I'll start the, with the first question or first part of the question, uh, Kaushik. So. Assume that you are an organization where you have like uh, 10,000 plus service provider. You can't go and do due, due diligence with the same rigor or same scrutiny for all 10,000. So you have to identify low hanging fruits, right? And then you have to identify who are at the risk like or posing maximum of the risk. Tiering starts playing important role, right? And you have to prioritize what you want to focus. It's not something that a low like a lower tiered vendor is not of risk but you know that it is a lower risk and then you are deprioritizing it or you are going with lesser scrutiny on that it has to be balance of your operational aspect right if someone says go and audit all 10000 uh, vendors probably it's not practical it's not doable so you have to identify what are your top 100 vendors how you want to assist them uh, start with your uh, the point incoming point right engage with procurement team so that you know that what is the first point of contact when someone is being introduced in your uh, environment and then identify build process where if any outsourcing uh, company is being introduced uh, you have guardrails in place to take care of compliance and security second part i think it service providers where their core business is to offer services to customer they have been super conscious about it right they know that they can't serve if they are not meeting the compliance requirement and not meeting compliance and security requirement can be edge case for someone else for example if there is a data center not offering pci dss compliance or iso 27000 compliance someone else will be building the data center and saying that i am pci dss compliant i am iso 27001 compliant come and like host your services on me so that can become business differentiator so they are conscious they are playing important uh, role in terms of maintaining the compliance so that they can offer more services uh, to more customers, more regulated customers. At the same time, what need to be ensured is that those are not just like kept on surface. Actually, those controls are being met and how they're handling if it is coming to offering segregation or isolation between one customer to another customer. So I think due diligence is still required, but I think IT service providers or uh, services they are doing a little better job because they understand that if they don't offer security and compliance with right rigor they will lose business pretty quick someone else will be building secure and compliant services and offer it in market absolutely absolutely swati and i believe that uh, again taking a cue from uh, swati's past experience swati would have done a lots and lots of audits where when she went on site and when she went and uh, talked to the customer at that time, the customer said, okay, I need the compliance the next one month. Otherwise, I'll be breaching my MSC policy as well with the customer. Because if they are not compliant even for a day or so, then it would be a breach of their MSC, which they would have signed with, uh, uh, let's say, the end customer as well. And accordingly, they have to maintain their compliance certifications yes. and things like that, right? Um, which is right, rightly being mentioned by Swati. So uh, I believe that okay, all the other questions um, uh, we'll just note it down and uh, we'll share, um, uh, let's say, a communication after this particular uh, webinar with all of you. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot for all the questions and uh, bearing with us as well for the entire session. It's quite impressive that all of you took out time from a very very busy schedule uh, to listen to uh, us. Uh, we are coming up with lots and lots of cybersecurity webinars uh, followed by the fireside chat in a similar manner. So uh, please bookmark us uh, for all the latest updates. And uh, again, thanks a lot, Swati, uh, for being with us, answering all of the questions. 
uh, and we wish you the best for all of your upcoming endeavors. Thanks, thanks, Lord Swati. Thank you so much, Kaushik. And I think one last point that our audience should not miss: uh, choosing right auditor is key, right? So they should engage with the auditors who are experienced in their field. They know their subject. Subject they are not theoretical. They understand customer pain points. So people should engage someone like you uh, so that they can get right advice, right advice at the right point, and not. Just the theoretical stuff that people offer sometimes. Lord Swati, for those kind words. Um, <laughs> although, uh, believe me, guys, I didn't uh, request her for any of these, but she's saying it from her heart, right? So, uh, thanks a lot, uh, team, for joining us, uh, and have a very good rest of the day. Thanks, thanks a lot. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all the time we have today. Hopefully, you found this webinar useful. We have a few questions still from the audience that we will address in an email shortly. A summary and a recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone early next week. Please visit our website at www.controlcase.com for more webinars. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the time that you all have taken out of your day to join us. Have a great day and until the next webinar, goodbye.